Hello, and welcome to the BYU Library Family History Webinar. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Olivia Tuller, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on February 8th with Maureen Brady. She will be giving a presentation entitled, Analyzing Your Research. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from James Tanner on how to fix damaged photos. Before we begin, here's a little bit about James. James has over 40 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star Blog. He has served as a family history volunteer for 18 years and has presented at expos and conferences around the US, Canada, and Europe. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the Family History Guide Association and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. James is a professional photographer and has seven children, 34 grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. And we'll now turn the time over to James if he's ready. I'd like to welcome everyone today to the a webinar for the BYU Library Family History Center, which is the new name of the library. And we are going to talk today about how to fix damaged photos. Um, this is something that I've been doing for many, many years, and uh, we'll get into some details. And one thing that, uh, for just an introduction, that's important is that there has been a let's call it dramatic change in the abilities of the programs that deal with, with um, photo, photos, images, digital images, uh, pretty obviously spread out through what's called, uh, spread through what's called artificial intelligence. And the changing and the programs are changing almost daily. And uh, the latest one at the time of this particular webinar was that, uh, Google has increased their BARD, which they may change the name of in any time, uh, to accepting and generating images. So uh, that just happened today as I give this webinar. So I'm trying to figure out if that's going to be something that I'll be looking at. But to begin the process, we're going to be talking about old photographs. In other words, photographs that um, you would normally have and either 35 millimeter slides or other slide uh, formats or, or printed on uh, paper or something of that nature. In other words, uh, information that we gather uh, that came from uh, the time before computers and before scanning. But everything begins with scanning because we can't really do anything with the paper photography. We need to have um, the a digital image to to preserve the image first of all, and secondly to do any make any changes to the image itself. That's not to say that in the past there hasn't been some of that, and I'll show show some of the uh, old history here in just a minute. So this class is going to be about editing digitized or scanned physical photographs, not original paper uh, photos, negatives, or slides. So you're, we're going to, uh, to be getting into digital images. The question that comes up almost immediately and uh, consistently is what to do with all of the old photos uh, once you've scanned them. Uh, the answer is we, we caution people because we should be sure to keep and preserve the originals after scanning physical photographs because they are unique artifacts. They're physical artifacts. There's an image, uh, obviously in the past, there, was, there were ways of uh, duplicating the, a photograph. It usually took place when you took a picture, a, a photograph of the, of the paper photograph. In other words, by using a camera, you made a, a duplicate image of the photo. So that was only done 
or at, at the time of the that the images were um, were created at, and uh, they you could also come up with a negative if you had a, if there was a negative and some of the older photos obviously didn't even have negatives because negative photography was involved much later than after than the actual beginning and if you had a negative you could print more copies but generally speaking when we have as genealogists inherit a set of a bunch of photographs each of the ones we have is is usually unique um this of course varies um if they were more recent um in the last say 50 years or so 20, 25 to 50 years it's very possible that people would order multiple copies of a photo and so it's it's not unusual to find uh, multiple copies but it still does not you know that's still very unique each photograph is is um, something that we need to to uh, pass on to family members and keep and preserve it. In some cases, if the people who are involved in the photos are uh, uh, well known people or uh, are prominent in the in history of some kind, then their uh, images, those original images, may be. Uh, valuable enough to to uh, be preserved in an archive or or a university special collections library. Okay, but we're going to I'm going to talk about and start with some history because uh, it's always important in genealogy it, and to recognize that genealogy is history, and that uh, when we're living within this this. Uh, area of the of history called genealogy we're working with people and one of the ways that we learn about our ancestors and then we can uh, really get some feeling for them is if we can find photographs of them and and understand what they looked like and what they uh, how they lived and and can see them and that makes uh, genealogy come more alive than than simply a list of births and deaths and and other uh, records. But uh, in order to understand that, we have to know that there's a time limit here. And the time limit is that the first photograph ever taken was created in, 19, in 1826. And it was a simple image of a courtyard in uh, the photographer's uh, estate. And I'm not going to uh, pretend to pronounce his names in uh, French. Uh, but he was, uh, it took eight hours to expose this one photo. And uh, it marks the beginning. That was the first time people realized that there was a way of preserving a, a view that was different. Uh, I realized there's not a lot you can see here in this photograph. But almost immediately, well, it wasn't that fast, but uh, as photography began to um, proliferate and as having photos taken became more than a one-time event in a person's life and that there was an opportunity to use photos for other purposes. Uh, retouching photos was almost immediately something that people began to do. And if you look closely at these two photos, you'll see the, the one on the left that begins on the left is is uh, a little bit different than the one on the right. And the one on the right makes the person look a little bit different than they were. Uh, and how did they do this? Well, they did this by physically altering either the negative in some cases, or if this was just a, a positive print, then they would be, um, they would go in and physically change it. In other words, use paint, uh, pencils, uh, paint, uh, and other things on the on the negative to change the the information that was there. So this isn't something very new. It's something that's been around for a long time. It's just today the as I mentioned initially, the the advancement in the techniques that are now being done with artificial intelligence and using the digital process have 
carried this idea of, of retouching photos into uh, creating actual images that are almost, in most cases, indistinguishable from photographs. So we're going to start with with uh, kind of where it happened that there was a big, uh, this came in really into the public's um, eye of being able to, to uh, edit or develop a different kind of photograph is this the Cottingley Ferries hoax. And in this, what happened here in 1917 was there two young girls claimed to have taken pictures of fairies in their garden. And uh, then they, you know, later they admitted that they'd cut out illustrations from a book and pasted them onto cardboard and uh, used knitting needles to make them stand up. And so this is kind of a, a the, where this all began with, with uh, photography imitating life and was originally the original statement they made was a photograph is worth a, a thousand words or a million words or whatever. But on the other hand, uh, it began to be very aware that photography was just one way of, of representing reality and that it could be changed and that what was there and what was seen did not necessarily correspond to what we would call reality or truth. And that photo photography was just one way of, of expressing that. Now, of course, today, I don't need cardboard hat pins and paper. I created this image uh, just kind of as an, as an example from a, Adobe Firefly program. And all I had to do was ask for a girl talking to a, a fairy in a, a forest. And so these are the kinds of things, this is the dramatic change that we have today. Now, most people, when they're looking at this, would not think that this was something that they would confuse with reality. But back in when the those girls were doing those paper cutouts, people, even, uh, even prominent people, were, were basically pulled into that, into believing that these were, were legitimate photog photographs. Now, understanding that because of the equipment that, that was used initially, that taking a good photograph could be extremely challenging. And so it's not unusual to find that in older photographs, except those done by professionals in studios or, or to that level, uh, were, are going to be very difficult uh, to actually capture all the information that we could today. And uh, you're going to see a variety of difficulties. And there's, there's kind of a tendency on people to, when they see this and know that there are tools out there that they can use to change that and, and make it look better, is to do that. In other words, uh, a natural in inclination to say, oh, this picture looks really bad. Let's see if we can improve it. Well, the issue there is, is um, that taking a professional quality photo today is still very challenging. And uh, improving on and editing, editing photos in a fundamental way, not just a superficial way of changing the lighting or getting them darker, lighter, or whatever, is actually manipulating the image itself and, and creating uh, or, or repairing the image if, if it's been damaged or scratched or torn or whatever is still very challenging. It's not something that uh, you can just sit down and say, oh, I'm going to make this one. Now, there's lots of programs out there, but we're going to talk about the specific ones that, that are uh, sophisticated enough to be uh, uh, professional quality, to give professional quality. And then uh, we'll go on with that. And I would point out that learning how to take good photographs can take years of education and experience. And here we have some bad examples. And I'm going to, uh, almost everything I am going to show today is either photographs that I took or that came through me to me through my family. So these are my own uh, 
you want to look at it, genealogically oriented uh, images and the ones that I've uh, gathered over the years. And the one on the left there is underexposed. What the, the interesting thing that we would want to see in that photo is what's in the dark. And if we, uh, the way it was taken is that the camera was set to take a picture of the, the canyon wall and underexposed the, the foreground. So we really have a hard time seeing. We can see something that looks like maybe a Jeep or a vehicle, but that's all we get the information in that front of that photo. And then the one on the top right is just out of focus. Uh, it's just bothersome. Uh, you can see some of the detail, but when you look at it closely, it's all blurry. And and it uh, unless it was intentionally done, which it was not in this case, uh, it was. Uh, it's can be something that uh, uh, is is difficult to, to to like. And most of the most of the time, we would uh, if I were sorting through my photos like this, and which I am doing right now, as a matter of fact. Uh, on a very long-term project is to uh, is basically get rid of these photos that that are not preserving any particular information about the family or of historic or genealogical interest. The one in the bottom is a little bit different. This one is actually caused by a defect in the camera lens and the way that the camera lens was is, uh, was focusing and taking light. And the vignette process, what it called vignette, is the dark area that you can see in the upper corners of the corners of the photo. And vignetting is another issue that uh, that happens uh, frequently and that you'll see. So these are not examples of good photographs. This is this is something that you would uh, you would see. And so the question always comes up, oh, can I fix that photo? And that's where we get to today. So as I mentioned, that it's very, at the beginning, the equipment was difficult to use and very expensive. And uh, when you're in a, when you're a professional photographer, you find that the equipment's still difficult to use and it's still expensive. But a lot of the parts of that were, were difficult previously have now been transferred to very complex programs that are used to um, that can be used to edit the photography. And of course we have equipment that's changed and that leaves us with all the historical photos. So now uh, if you're using a smartphone to take photos, uh, it's very it's normal to see that your your photo is, uh, is acceptable or it, it could be pretty good and so if it isn't what do you do well you look at it right when you take it and you take another photo uh, if it doesn't work the first time that you change something on your phone and and make it a, a different photo and since it's a digital photo then it's very forgiving and you can go in and make changes on it from for a digital photo that was taken that you could not make on the on the paper photographs. So this is a, it's a different world when you get into the last few years as uh, as cameras have evolved into a, a phone and that phones have evolved into cameras. But here it still leaves us with the question of what we do with all those old photo old damaged photographs. And so we have, uh, in your, my case, uh, because I have been involved in genealogy and because I have a very large family uh, that I had, would have contact with, the I have uh, literally thousands and thousands of photos. I inherited a, a, a set of photos from my great-grandmother uh, that she was a professional photographer and my great-great-grandfather was a also a professional photographer. And uh, my family has always been involved in and taking pictures and, and uh, our family is probably the most uh, uh, documented family you could possibly imagine as far as the number of photos that, that are available for the family. 
this gives us uh, uh, some challenges because some of the older photos are uh, either severely damaged or uh, don't look so great. And we would wish that they were a little bit better uh, in, with the way they looked. So that gives us into and got me into this program. Um, quite a few years ago, you'll see the copyright on this is 1989 and 90. And the first time that it was uh, released was in 1985, 86, and 87 as a, as a Macintosh app or Mac app um, <clears throat> from Apple computer back then. And um, it was because of my interest in photography. Uh, I've been using Photoshop since it was introduced. And I was well into computers by 1989 and uh, had all was also well into photography by 1989 actually my interest in photography started when i was about eight years old and so i've been taking photos for a very many years on a variety of cameras and uh it'll, and now i've been doing uh, digital photography for many years so being involved in, in photography and computers and genealogy and, and acquiring this large collection. My grandmother's name was uh, Margaret Godfrey Jarvis Overson. And she, uh, as her in her uh, professional years as a photographer, uh, took photos from around uh, the early 1900s until 19, around 1950 when she got too old to do anything and she had um and through long circumstances her collection of photos including glass plates and negatives and all the photos came out to be about 4600 images and there's more out there that weren't in her immediate control because she was professional and was selling photos uh, you know, photographs off to people all the time. So there's a lot of her photographs around in uh, some parts and old trunks and, and uh, some of the museums and things. But the major part of that collection I digitized over a long period of time. And then um, through a series of circumstances, uh, I was approached by the University of Arizona that, that it would like their her collection. And so now her entire collection is being maintained by the University of Arizona's uh, photography collections. And uh, they, if you know anything about photography, University of Arizona has the Ansel Adams photography collection. So it's a major place for, uh, for viewing historical collections is from the University of Arizona in Tucson. Now, Adobe's changed over the years, and so has Photoshop. Um, and now we're up to version 25.4.0, unless a new one has come out in the last couple of days, which is very impossible. And the main issue here is that they have incorporated uh, into many of the editing programs uh, artificial intelligence, which uh, makes it sometimes a little easier to do uh, editing, photo editing, but has now proliferated the number of, of uh, features of a program like Photoshop into uh, possibly over a thousand features. And Photoshop can take months, maybe a years to learn. If you, if you were just really interested in using Photoshop and had a reason to to learn all of the other features you would be spending some considerable time taking formal classes and and use and using manuals that are uh, hundreds and hundreds of pages so <clears throat> but some of the simplest issues are are resolved and i'll talk about that in a moment and the answer is that fortunately you don't have to know everything or learn everything about Photoshop and how to edit photos in order to correct some of the, the basic issues that we have with, with photographs. And 
there are dozens of other photo editing apps at all levels. And we'll talk, and I'll talk about those. So here's some of the levels of, of, uh, of editing, editing programs. Uh, Photoshop for PC and Mac, and uh, it's from Adobe, and all of all the Adobe products now are not uh, are on a subscription basis. They have a, a, a kind of an umbrella company, uh, an umbrella product called the Creative Cloud. And if you subscribe to the Creative Cloud, then you can get Photoshop and many of the other programs they have. The other one they have is Lightroom. And Lightroom is now implementing uh, both Photoshop and Lightroom are very uh, much into, I've been, been uh, programmed in the last less than a year uh, into very many, uh, de very dependent on um, artificial intelligence. So their AI features are, and they're changing virtu virtually every day. I get upgrades to Adobe products almost every single day. And so that's something that's changing dramatically. These Both of these programs are fairly expensive. And even on uh, even if on based on the the uh, subscription basis, they're expensive. Photoshop Elements is a less expensive program, and it's sold differently than fo than the uh, Creative Cloud documents. And so it's uh, it's something that you might consider if you were not wanting to be a professional and spending the money every year to keep your Photoshop. Uh, subscription up. And then there's a very much, you call this uh, Photoshop Lite, I guess, if you wanted to. It's called Photoshop Express. And uh, it's actually a, an on, a, a online program. So you may want to look into Photoshop Express as a possibility. However, as you go down this list, the ability of the program to edit uh, real difficulties with the older photographs becomes less and less you know, useful. they just not as useful for doing it. There's other photograph programs out there. Cyberlink Photo Director is one. It's for PCs. And Corel Paint Shop Pro is also for PCs. And you'll find other photographs. But basically, um, applying styles to a photo is not photo editing. When we're talking about photo editing, what we're talking about is actually changing the, the image into something that it was not originally. And many of the less expensive photo manipulation programs will give you uh, menus of the ways you can change the light and the color and the whatever, but they don't really address directly uh, to at the, any with any sophistication, uh, correcting the the uh, image itself or making the image uh, look like it was not damaged. So here's an example, and this is an example of Photoshop editing, edit using AI gener generative editing. the The one on the left is, and actually, this is my grandfather when he was in the army and uh, just highlight oh, sorry wrong direction some of the problems the 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 photo itself as you can see in different parts is torn uh, it's been used and carried around and folded and so now it's it's torn obviously there's a part here that's been folded uh, this bottom part is missing to some extent. Now, fortunately, in this particular instance, the the image itself of, of my grandfather uh, and his uniform and and uh, uh, wherever he was located at this time is uh, is not damaged extensively. So, repairing this photo is not going to change the subject and the main informational value of this photo. And you can see on the right-hand side what it looks like after I've spent a few minutes, maybe 15 or 20 minutes, uh, 
rebuilding that photo using Photoshop. And then you'll see also I did change the the cast of the photo. I changed it to a, a brown cast. Um, I could change that with probably with any of the as long as this is a digital image and these remind remember that I've this original over on the left was scanned in and so what I'm working with is not the paper itself the paper sits in a file uh, and then I now have the digital image and so now I have a digital image now the answer that somebody would say is can you print the different the digital image yeah but I could print a copy of that photograph um, it's something that I'm sort of disinclined to do for for the reason that I have uh, tens of thousands into the hundreds of thousands of photographs, and I uh, certainly do not want that much paper, that much more paper that I have to uh, to store and uh, deal with. Fortunately, since I was able to uh, give this major collection to the University of Arizona, that that relieved me of about 4,600 photos. So I showed this one earlier, that these are difficult or impossible editing and restoration issues. And uh, basically the question is, is that, uh, okay, now we have this fabulous idea of artificial intelligence manipulating, fo manipulating photos and actually creating images and uh, so why can't we do something with this photo? Well, because uh, the photo, what you have here in the photo is a, is a piece of paper that has all of its information in that particular format. And so it's not something that I can, uh, to get more information out of this photo than, it, than, I, than by trying to use anything. So once I digitize it, the digital image has only the information contained in the original paper photo. So you can't restore this missing content. I wanted to do this, so I went put this into Photoshop and uh, worked with it for a while. And and uh, uh, if I'd been able, to, if this had been an original digital photo and the and the image had looked like this, it depending on the camera and the and the type of, of digital camera that it was that took the image it may very well be that the information is there that it that the camera itself gathered all that information um, if you're wondering for example about cameras and uh, uh, what's happening with cameras basically the smartphone cameras that we have today are are more sophisticated than any camera you could have purchased years ago and uh, if i had, if this image here had been taken with uh, with a digital camera first of all we would have seen that it hadn't worked first in the first instance but with the way that the the smartphone cameras like with the iphone and and the uh, the other cameras that are available would use you, you could have redone this photo in, uh, instantly you'd say oh that one didn't come out click another one and uh, even if you had taken this photo, it's very likely that the information to lighten up the image would have been there. But what happens if I try to do that to a digitized image from the physical image is this is, this is the best uh, amount of detail that I could recapture from that uh, paper photograph. So it's not quite enough to recognize who it is, but it it is old enough to recognize that he has a face mask on and we probably don't know who it is anyway. Now, without getting into much technical difficulty here and talking about technical aspects of photography, the, um, <clears throat> the, the important thing to understand is that there are some paper images, the old images, this simply can't be fixed. There's nothing, uh, no uh, digitizing this image and working with it just cannot reconstruct this image. There's nothing about this. Excuse me. There's nothing that we can do to fix this. This, 
this is uh, has more than one defect. Uh, first of all, it's double exposure it means there's two images were made over each other, which is no longer possible with a uh, you can you can create the same effect by by layering images, but uh, the cameras themselves will not take uh, will not take double imaging. So there's just no way that's going to happen. And the other one, of course, if you recall the vignetting in the upper left-hand corner is the dark, the dark up there is um, from that. And it's also blurry, which means there's nothing really we can do to, to uh, repair that part of the image. So if the image is, if the information is missing, and when I use the term information, I'm saying the, what the image communicates and when when an image like this is blurry and you can't really tell what the object is. Now, if you know enough about, um, you can maybe guess this, if you have enough back historical re remember memories going back a lot of years, you may understand that this is early on in, in one of the Disneyland parks and uh, it's under construction. But if the information's missing, like it is in this photo, the detail is missing, and there's no way to regenerate or correct that. So it's just not going to happen. And so these photos, if unless there's some sentimental value of this particular photo, would be would be disposed of, just thrown away. There's just no reason to keep it. It doesn't convey any information that we can use. But be conservative with. When you and also be conservative when you start doing destructive editing. Now, what we mean by destructive editing is that we're making changes that change the original photograph. So if I take that photograph and I make it lighter, or I make it uh, a different tint, or I make it give it some kind of style from uh, the thousands of styles that would be available. That isn't destructive. The, the original information in the photograph may be, is, can be entirely, um, you can view it and you can get what you needed to identify the people, identify the place that has the information that we're trying to convey from the photograph. But if you did do destructive editing, and, and most of what I'm showing and talking about when in the when I show the editing, it, it falls into the destructive category. In other words, I'm physically changing the image into something that it was not originally. And to the extent that happens, uh, you have to understand that the in some cases the historical value of the photo cannot be recovered. So if you think well. You know, we can do this to the grant to my grandmother. We can make her look happier. Or we can make her look uh, uh, younger, or we can do whatever. Well, what you're creating an essentially what is not, which is no longer historic art artifact, and you have lost uh, the historic value. So even though the the image may be not so acceptable, and it may be damaged. You want to make sure that that, and whatever you do, does not change the uh, the content of what's there, and that's kind of a hard thing to understand, but it's something that I see very frequently online, especially where they've got an old photograph and and it's not. Uh, if you take the original and look at it, you realize that the person has been changed to the point where. It's almost, they're almost unrecognizable from uh, what was in the original photograph. So here's an example of that. So exactly how we want to do this. And that is, this is um, actually my grandfather uh, built this house back in the 1920s. And so it's our original, one of our original homes. And there's, um, of course, there's a car sitting in the, you know, whatever you want to call it, the cement slab off to the side of the house. And there are some defects. Those <clears throat> defects are in the original photograph, and you can, uh, the 
paper photograph that this was scanned from. So you can see some of these and they were, uh, they're either scratches or marks or some kind. And there's a number of those in the photograph. The question is, do we want to change that and uh, eliminate those cracks in the photo? Uh, they just, they detract from the information. Can that be done without changing and, and uh, making the information change about the, the identity and the and what the house looked like? And the answer to that is yes, you can probably do that. And so I spent some time working on that aspect and uh, wanted to take out the the weird color casting there and uh, decided I could get more information and make it look nicer in a black and white photo or a, a grayscale photo. And then the question comes up, what about the car? Do we want the car out of the photo? What do we want to do? Now, obviously, if you know, if you've seen anything about photo editing in the last few years, you know very uh, easily can sit there and look at that and say, yes, of course I can remove that car from the photo with Photoshop or with any kind of similar program that's out there and how that does that. But if you think about it for just a second, you'll realize that the information behind the car is not visible in this photograph. And so if you take the car out of the photograph, what's behind there and what gets generated by the computer is not reality. It's not really what was there. It's just uh, what the, the uh, program or the uh, AI program in this case would uh, kind of guess would be a, a, that particular information. So yeah, I can take it out, it's gone. And you can look at this and probably not be able to tell that there was ever a car there. And uh, there's some additional, uh, it looks like a pile of things there under the one window. And that may or may not have been the original. In other words, if you'd been in the house that day and taken and looked there, that's not probably maybe not what's there. The, the question is, why is that an issue? Why wouldn't we want to take the car out? And the answer to that is because you've destroyed the historical, some of the historical value of the image because the car helps to date the photo. We know when the car was built because we can look and see what year that Chrysler was built. And uh, we may not know that much about the, the condition of the house, but that car gave us a date, an actual date for this particular, when this particular photograph was taken. And so taking out that kind of information is, uh, can become a problem. Using, using the tools can take some time. Now, I, that photograph of the house and the car uh, was with the new AI uh, photo shop uh, features is uh, fairly straightforward and very simple. But this is uh, something that even if I use Photoshop 2024, it's very, uh, it's going to take a little while and I don't want to um, change the integrity of the image of the, of the boy in the picture. So the one on the left is what this original tintype looked like. This is a photograph made onto a, a tin plate, metal plate. And uh, on the right is the cleaned up photo that I did after a period of time with, um, with Photoshop. And it, it looks better, it's more presentable. Uh, it loses the context of the old photograph. So the question is, which one do you prefer and which one do you think? My answer is always both. If you want to, if you want to fix the photo, that's great, but don't destroy and don't get rid of the original. So that's kind of the, the attitude that we have.
And I think that it is important, and you can see from this image, that incremental changes can help without destroying the subject. I didn't, it's still the same recognizable subject. It's just not the other items in the photo are less of a distraction than the original photo where the damage was done. And if you get into other photos, now this is a photograph. Um, this is the one on the left is a digital copy of a print from a glass plate negative. So originally, uh, one of the historic ways of doing photographs was by using glass plates coated with a, with a silver subject substance that would then eggs actually and silver who would that would make a, a negative of the um, of the image and then a positive could be printed onto a, uh, to paper or to uh, another glass negative glass plate so some of the glass plates would have negatives some of them have positives and in this case uh, working on taking out that information obviously there's some things i don't know what was in the original photograph that's under the blacks um, deterioration of the original photo and uh, so i basically had to make a decision as to what i wanted it to look like and after working with it and this took considerably longer time than any of the other photo changes that i did so this is this is something that you can do what i'm saying is that this is not and especially with a, a photo of this old and of this quality you certainly do not want to to use a, a program that and overdo it and use a program that radically changes or uh, let's say improves on uh, my great grandmother's uh, this is my great great grandmother this is the one who was the photographer's mother and remembering that there are limits to what can be done to repair really really bad um, um, images the one on the left is uh, has a camera problem the camera was either opened or it leaks uh, it has a vignetting problem it's blurry um, the camera was either moved while it was being taken or it just simply didn't wasn't in focus and it uh, no matter what you do to it and no matter how much ch change you can get a little tiny bit more information out of the photo but you still really can't tell what is going on here. If you're wondering what this is, that this is a picture up at uh, Petrified Forest National Park in, in Arizona. Now, one thing that's helpful, very helpful, is you can scan a, a negative in high resolution. And then you can simply use a common program, com programs that come in a lot of a lot of cases with your computer um, uh, like the ones like the photos program on on the macintosh or the other photo programs on the pcs and they can then you can use the and just simply reverse the image which is something that they do uh, that most of the even the least expensive programs or free programs can do so once you've done that then you have a positive image of the same negative so if you think the idea of you have a bunch of old negatives laying around you digitize the negatives and then you simply use the program to reverse the image and that gives you the the, the lovely positive this is very nice image uh, this is one of the ones from my great-grandmother and it uh, and among others of thousands of others that were taken when in her studio you can see the sort of makeshift background that they had that she had for the photos just one thing you may have inherited um, scrapbooks of photos now the worst case scenario for the scrapbooks is when people wanted to improve on the original photo by cutting it out or using pinking shears to give it a ragged edge or something and 
paste it into the book. Well, uh, that, of course, is uh, it really damages the image and, and makes it, uh, in a lot of cases, genealogically not very valuable because the context of the image has been has disappeared. This is on uh, the older, older uh, book, scrapbooks or photographic albums used as kind of black cardboard type paper. And uh, a lot of the people uh, have just pasted them down with paste, uh, glued them to the page. Well, interestingly enough, uh, soaking the photograph doesn't hurt it. Um, it, it might you might have to be careful not to use too much water and and dry it with uh, a little bit of pressure on it, like a, a putting it in paper towels or something. But I wouldn't do this with uh, unless you really had a reason to. And one of the major reasons for doing this, obviously, is that you don't want to lose the information, but that you may find that a lot of these photographs have the identity of the people here um, that has been written on the back of the photograph. And by taking them out of the um, out of the album and and getting them off of that black paper, using just and basically you can take them off and then soak the water a little bit at a time on the back and and use like a plastic spoon or something to to scrape off the black until you can read the the uh, caption or whatever was written on the back maybe there's nothing written on the back and it doesn't help but on the other hand uh, it's a way of getting more information but before you do that edit and begin editing, digitize the whole scrapbook page. Why? Because the, the arrangement of the photos, and there may be also other information here, will tell us sometimes tell us who these people are. So you can soak it in warm water and carefully peel off the photographs. It's very uh, time consuming, and it's uh, but it's one way of getting to that information. Now, this is um, just kind of finishing up here. This is, but there's not really anything terribly wrong with the left, uh, the photo in the left. Um, but it is a little bit, it's it's um, quite a bit at an angle. And if you look at it, it's not a very pleasant photograph. And there's those uh, glue down things on the corners that were used to glue down the original photograph and some other things. So we can clean that up and straighten the horizon and get a, a, a much better photograph of the same. And, and the information in the second photograph is essentially the same as in the original. Same thing here with this photo. This building on the left corner is has a number of defects. Uh, and it's hard to see some of the information that's available. And by processing that uh, original information, uh, you can see that it becomes much more of a much more useful photograph and something that's uh, that's you can see more details and see more. Uh, and it's a, a better photograph. And basically that when you're going from that old photograph to the new photograph, this is where we're starting to get into information that only comes through experience and uh, spending uh, huge amounts of time doing uh, doing old photographs. Because it's not something you can immediately identify exactly what has to be done to uh, to make the image look better. Sometimes when you make changes, it looks worse. And then you go back and forth and back and forth until you figure out exactly what it is that needs to be done. And the more you do this, the more practice you have in doing it, and the more information you learn about how to use Photoshop and some of the other programs, then the more you're, uh, you're likely to come up with uh, a good image at the end. So the point here is to keep learning and um, and make sure that you spend the time necessary to understand what you're doing 
and how to preserve uh, some of the, make sure you're preserving and not destroying the information in the original photograph. Okay, well, thanks for watching. And this ends here with an AI generated image using Adobe Firefly. This is an AI generated photograph or image. So I guess it ceases to be a photograph, but it's now an image. And uh, it would be since the time that this was done, which was done a, a couple of weeks ago, because I try to do my presentations in advance, this, just in the last few days, Adobe came out with Firefly 2, and the images coming from Firefly 2 are markedly superior to these images, if you can imagine it getting uh, any better looking uh, image. And this is, there is, this is a made up image. I gave a description of what I wanted this scene to look like, and the computer image was created by Adobe Firefly. Okay, well, thanks for watching. Yeah, my grandfather in the hammock, part of the hammock and the fringe missing. Did AI do that or your choice when fixing the background? No, AI did that. Um, AI actually reconstructed a background for it that did not include the fringe. Um, if I were going to spend a lot more time on that photo and I thought that the fringe needed to be preserved, then I would have uh, been able to make more detail, take smaller um, parts of the image until I had reconstructed the image and left that um, fringe there. And so your good, good eye there because uh, uh, it would take, you, you know, you can take them back and forth and then you begin to notice that the differences when you do the editing. Uh, there's a program on my heritage that can improve old color photos and it leaves uh, my heritage on the photo. Is this a layer or can it be removed? The answer is those are water called watermarks and no, they can't be um, uh, removed. But the, uh, the photo editing on uh, my heritage is strictly AI, but um, there's no way it's, it's done to the entire photo. And so I chose not to refer to the my heritage uh, way of editing the photos in this presentation because I was focusing on actually changing the, fixing the content. And when I, AI does it, when my heritage does it all at once on the photo, um, there's a tendency to get information that's different than that's in the original photo. It's not bad. Sometimes it looks remarkable, uh, but uh, in a lot of cases, if you put some of these photos that were in here, if I were to run those through my heritage, because I've done um, a few hundreds of them through my heritage, uh, would not be fixed. In other words, there's things that that particular uh, program cannot cannot resolve. And so it's just uh, it's understanding that there that there are tools that can and and. Uh, uh, it's fortunately or unfortunately, Fire, uh, Photoshop is a very, very complex program. But there are cheaper versions that are that are uh, easier to use. Aren't ten times reverse images? Uh, yes, there. Well, uh, there's daguerreotypes, which are. Uh, the before the pre the previous from tin types and it depends on how the tin types sometimes you're getting a you get a uh, they're not a pot they're not a positive because they're they're flipped horizontally uh, sometimes and so there's there's uh, different levels of them but that um, digital image was just a straight off of the tin type that I that's my photo that I I mean I own that tin type and digitize that image. So the, the digitize is exactly what it looked like. Nothing, nothing was done to the original tintype. Any other questions? Very good. Well, appreciate it. We'll see you then. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, James.
Thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is on February 8th with Maureen Brady. She will be giving a presentation entitled Analyzing Your Research. A recording of this webinar will be made available next week. You can view that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fh underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.